This episode is brought to you by AC Infinity. The Ion Beam Kit is AC Infinity's full spectrum LED bar lighting. This kit includes a lighting controller, four LED grow light bars, and four steel bars that allow for flexible mounting on any part of the grow tent. Its unibody housing and aluminum board feature full spectrum Samsung LM301H white LEDs. And the beauty of it is, you can integrate this with all the AC Infinity products in your garden. And if for some reason you don't already have the Controller 6.9 Pro, well, this kit includes an innovative controller that features four brightness intensity levels and four daily timer settings. This LED is not only efficient, but very affordable, especially when using that discount code, the stash 15 at checkout. IPM, we might even get a little bit into plant viruses if we've got time or feel, feel like getting into oh, that. That's nasty. But uh, special guest, Matthew Gates. Let's bring him in. Matthew, wicked. Thank you. Drag him in. There we go. What's up, face. Matthew? Hey, how you doing, man? Hey, everyone. Welcome, man. You've been Welcome, on my man. podcast on before, my- and I uh, just dropped a ton of knowledge. Um, you know, I know you're an IPM specialist. Uh, I'm not sure what other certifications you have, but uh, man, just every time you speak about pests and viruses, it's just the mind blows up. And uh, figured, you know, super excited to have you on here today because those topics in particular, we really haven't talked about a whole lot on the From the Stash podcast. So having you on here um, to kind of drop knowledge bombs on us, I think is going to be valuable for not only us, but for our audience as well. So thanks for coming on. Can you uh, tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. So I've been working in the space for 13 years now this year. I always count it as uh, April when I started. Um, so that'll be 13 years. I, uh, I've, i yeah, at this point I've been working mostly in, but I also have experience in ornamental cut flowers like Gerbera daisies and roses and things like that. And I've also worked, uh, I spent two years in the People's Republic of China where I've worked with uh, sorghum and wheat, but also tea and tomatoes and things like that. So I, I have a pretty eclectic um, experience with the, with various kinds of plants. And uh, with regards to this in particular, um, I have, like, for example, I recently completed the Pestapalooza that I have. It's a sem- IPM seminar about uh, dealing with common pests and, and, and how, to, you know, how to treat them, how to prevent them, and to know more about them. I also have my YouTube channel, Xenthanol. Xenthanol Consulting is my consulting work. And you can find a bunch of footage and pictures and other information about mainly pests at this point. Again, um, so if you need help identifying them or if you need to know more about their biology to try to fight them better. Um, like you say, I always uh, I like to focus on sometimes the really interesting, holistic, you know, uh, complex uh, factors, which gives people better informed decision making and also allows you to understand good products from bad products or good techniques that are relevant for your context. So I really appreciate you having me on. Thanks a lot. Yeah, it's our it's it's, it's an absolute honor. Um, I, I honestly believe that the conversation around IPM and and pests, which I generally hate to have because it's just it's one of those things that you just want to completely avoid. But if ignorance gets you nowhere and I feel like the more that we can understand and you know, uh, identify pests and and problems, we can kind of prevent them. Um, if somebody was going to get going on an IPM or kind of familiarize themselves with pests, where do you think they should start? I think the most important thing is like step zero is to like know what potential pests you can have for any crop. So for there's a lot of there's a lot of pests that are uh, common in other crops too. So there's a lot of research already about them, a lot of treatment possibilities um, and things like that. But the first thing to do always is to find out what pests you have to deal with. So you've got things like Western flower thrips and the aphid, which you have here, and the budworm moths and, uh, and bud rot, although there's a little caterpillar picture here as well. So knowing those pests is really important. Knowing if those pests are on other plants is also important because many times I've worked with clients where they eradicate a problem where they manage it very, very well, but they keep coming back. And the reason why is because right outside their door, you know, there's some... Uh, some plant that the pest can host onto and then move quickly into the into the area, whether it's an indoor facility or sort of an outdoor grow, both of these are kind of a problem. So knowing those two things, knowing what's relevant in your area, knowing what could be a pest for your crop, those are like steps zero and one. And if you have that information, believe it or not, you'll be ahead of a lot of people, uh, even people in the professional space, believe it or not. I totally agree. Yeah, I totally agree. And, you know, it's... 
I think it's important, like you said, to understand which pests you're dealing with and then to understand the environment which you're working in. Because personally, I feel like I, I, a, a major part of my IPM is almost the routine that I have when I'm working with my plants. I try to get into my garden first thing in the morning after a shower before I go outside and I start working on my outdoor plants or I go for a run as if I go for a run, but I'm trying to be general. Uh, you know, it's there, there's, there's some things that I feel as if you need to do before or after more things after, you know, get, get, get your outside activities done after you're in the garden and get and doing things, you know, keeping other plants in your house is one that I actually have never considered before. Cause this plant is kind of what I like to refer to it as so we can kind of keep clean, if you will. YouTube's kind of a bit of a, a hassle, but um, I, I, I never I never I never thought of, you know, another plant in the house having an issue. And so when someone's telling me, well, you know, pigeons, I have this issue that's very consistent and I've battled and battled. I've never thought to ask, well, what do you have? Do you have another plant? Do you have a fern? Anything? Do you have anything in your house that might be leading to that? You know, along with pets. You know, pets is something I think about, but never thought about plants. And that's where I, where I, I thank you for for opening up. Yeah, another one is uh, fruits and vegetables you might buy at the grocery store. Um, berries tend to have thrips a lot of times in my experience. You know, wash your fruit and take a look at it, and uh, you'd be surprised. So yeah, those those kinds of um, ingress points are often uh, misunderstood or or uh, simply overlooked yeah cut open cut open a um um your lettuce like a um romaine lettuce i think it is yeah, they call it and you cut open the bottom or iceberg lettuce that's what i'm talking about, iceberg lettuce and you cut it open and you can see the pests on the inside and very similar you know there's a lot of crevices that they can create when you've got a pot in the garden or lights and fans you know fans always collect so much dust and so on and so forth like equipment is another big one you know not cleaning not being sterile in between grows um yeah yeah this is yeah good, i think Go ahead, well, that that's a, a lot of things I think people overlook is you can be as clean as you want and do all these things, but then it comes into you being a plant person or a plant parent, and you're bringing all these plants that are more susceptible to having sort of pests and these different issues. And it's the same again with the fruit. That's never, ever been a thought in my mind. So that's definitely one to to keep more, especially buying organic fruits, things that sat there for a minute, you bring it home, it has one day shelf life, and you'll notice that you got some things flying right out of there. And especially now I'm dealing with a totally organic soil. And it seems like they thrive in that area. So I've really been trying to stay on it more. The fruit was, that's a great tip there. Now, do you, uh, uh, preventative methods, of course, are key. Do you believe in the traditional IPM that a lot of people do or anti that with neem oil being, you know, the devil, so to speak, to a lot of people? Do you have any, any stance on that? I'm not sure what you mean by that, really. So a lot of people are really anti-using neem oil for IPM in any sense that I mean it's always just preventative 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 but what happens when you can't let's say get rid of that you've already got these issues would you go as far as using some sort of you know killing technique or would you just still try to work preventative methods I mean I don't think those are mutually exclusive um, I wouldn't say that like neem oil is uh, abhorrent and you couldn't use it in any any particular context at all but it is important to know, like you know, how you're applying a product. Some products are not, I would say, are not uh, not appropriate if you're like flowering, for example. But other products are much more appropriate because you're not flowering. Those are like the, that's like a basic example. But also, you know, if you are interested in like if you're in an outdoor setting and you're near like a waterway or a lake or a pond or something, you know, and you're caring about the organisms in there, then you might not apply other products too, because you might be afraid of the runoff. Or maybe there's no problem as long as you apply a certain kind of way. Um, and you pay attention to things like, you know, the wind and um, and spraying and drenching and that sort of a thing, where all those, uh, where those uh, the off products go. I'm an advocate for using safe products, of course. Um, and there's a lot more there's more research coming out, but there's a lot less research than I'd like for obvious reasons with regards to. I do get questions from clients sometimes who are asking for like systemic pesticides and things. Uh, some of the more noxious stuff like malathion even or or avamectin or other mectins, and uh, I don't I don't advocate for those, for example. I've heard of ivermectin. Where have I heard that before? Ivermectin. 
No, abomectin. Oh, abomectin. Oh, I'm abomectin. sorry. It's I'm part sorry. of the mectin group. They're, they're pretty, they're systemic pesticides when they're used in that capacity, oftentimes. Okay, that's, pretty, that's it. They're pretty potent. Potent? They're pretty potent? Is that what you said? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I never, I, yeah. I, I, I I am definitely pro neem oil. I, I've I've used it for years, and I, I feel as if where the the um and I think I and I'm I I, sp I think I speak for Rob too. I think just the way we was asking the question was that the criticism around it, particularly I don't know if you've heard of I, of course you have um uh, CHS um hypermesis syndrome. I, I had to say it. Um, it, it it's often attributed to um, overdoses or at least negative reactions to the main element behind neem oil, which I'm unfamiliar with. Um, but so like as a directin, so because neem that, oil has other constituents. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Is it a, that's as as a directin? Sorry, one more time. As a directin. As a direct. As a directin. And then there's as other a big word guy. Other as a direct oil, but you can get just as a directin if you want. Um, you know. Or you can get neem oil, which has a bunch of other things from the neem tree. Right, right. Okay, and that's the, and again, I'm speaking kind of from my wherever, but uh, it, that's the ingredient that is, if I'm not mistaken, behind the misdiagnosis of CHS. And yeah, some people talk about it that way. I have an opinion on this. I actually don't think pesticides are. Um, always to blame in, in this case it certainly could be certainly if you're if you uh if you get a compound that's going to be emetic when you consume it that way obviously that can lead to that but i actually think that some of the interesting research coming out recently uh on some of the people who are talking about it who are more qualified than i am um you know medical doctors and things like this who are who are much more versed in than others they, I think that genetics plays a big role. And I think also, um, I think overconsumption often plays a role. Um, I think there's more research that has to be meet out to, to find that out. But I feel like, first of all, genetics can't help but play a role. It plays a role in all the other processes of our body. And people have very different sensitivities to things. And those change over time. So how you were at 20 is going to be different than 30, 40, 50, and so on. And then... Also, I do think that uh, in some cases, like if somebody, cons you know, you sometimes you you know where your your tolerance normally is, your limit, and sometimes people accidentally or intentionally kind of get close to that border or exceed it, and then I think that can cause sort of a um, a chain reaction for some people. Whereas I know other people, for example, I used to drink alcohol, not very, not too often, but often enough um, for an American, I suppose. And then at some point, my body just said no. I couldn't even drink a light beer if I wanted to, um, and I would I would have a I would have a reaction kind of similar to what we're talking about. And the only explanation I have is it's probably something genetic in me. Probably something changed and, and changed very rapidly. There was no like slow breakdown of tolerance. It just was it was like immediate. Just one day, uh, my body said uh, that's enough. <laughs> so I wonder yeah. about that quite a bit. I you know, it's I, I, I want to be a little bit more clear in regards, and this isn't something that I want to stay focused on. This is just a small, but I have a very important conversation. If we're going to have a conversation around IPM and, and if we're going to mention neem, I do want to mention the intoxication of that word that I was going to repeat, but I can't say it again because I was reading chat and they're saying the other one that I got mistaken. Um, what was the word again? One more time. Sorry. As a directin. Yes. Um, now, I understand that genetics plays a key part in um, uh, the, 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 the uh, response of, uh, you know, THC or whatever in our system, and it might be predisposed to having psychosis or so on and so forth. I understand that. But I also believe that there is a misuse of a lot of IPMs when the product specifically says that this can be used in flour and in reality not only can't it but it there it shouldn't um and and i believe neem is one of those things and so people are in fact not having a negative response to neem oil or, or, or sorry 
or the plant itself, they're having a negative response to the key elements in neem oil. And I, I just think I want to be very clear on that because yeah, I have a, yeah, I have an opinion as well. And I just think that, that I, whoever it is that's behind the, the, the narrative of, you know, I just feel like that's missed in regards to, you know, using IPMs incorrectly at the wrong time of its growth stage. Do you believe, and I just want to pass this off. Do you believe that there is a product that is, that is healthy enough to be applied to this plant in flower to prevent pests or maybe disease? Cause that is another conversation. So all products are going to be context dependent, right? So they're going to, it's going to be based on what you're using it for. I think there are, there are several products I think that would be, um, uh, very unlikely to be problematic for people when you apply to flower. Mostly I'm thinking of biopesticides, but I'm very, because of the nature, the dearth of research out there, which I mean, there's very little, um, kind of makes me cautious. But, you know, yeah, if you're going to ask me that question, I think there are certain products that go after certain organisms, not all organisms. Um, so like BT products, for example, would be one of those. It's also only really relevant during flower. So that's also part of the problem. You can't apply it before flower and have it be an issue. Um, I have a friend whose uncle I've talked about a few times on podcasts where when I was introduced to him, the long story short is that uh, I was introduced, oh, he's my friend. We've known each other, childhood friend, known each other for 20 plus years. You know, he's a bug guy. He's like, oh, I don't get bugs. I just spray this malathion. He died a few years ago. Oh, gosh. Rest yeah. Wow. So I, and that's a really incredibly toxic product. And it's one of those things where Ugh. you just didn't know. Yeah, and I think that's part of the problem is that some people are saying you can use it for who knows what reason. And other people are just presuming that's the case, again, for whatever reason. And I think that can lead to some great disasters. I agree with you. I, and I think it's, I'm glad you said pest. Like if, I'm not, if I picked up on it, you said BT products and I lost you there. What were you referring to as BT products? Yeah, so BT stands for Bacillus thuringiensis. That's a uh, that's a bacteria, almost a fungus. Um, so BT, so there's different subspecies, but basically you get different kinds of BT products that will target certain kinds, usually like different uh, families, like uh, Bacillus thuringiensis aizawi goes, or Christaki goes after caterpillars. So it's not going to work against flies. You would get BTI. Bacillus thuringiensis israelensis. Um, so those are two different BT products that you would apply for two different kinds of pests. And you can't really mix and match them. Some products are much more broad spectrum, like Bouveria bassiana, that's an entomopathogenic fungus. And in some research, it's even been shown to colonize inside the tissues. In that way, you might call it systemic, although it's not a chemical compound. You know what I mean? And in some no. research, there's... No, I really... I, I, I really I, I'm trying. I like I have you're very smart. You are very smart. And, and <laughs> you're with some of these terms that you're saying, I'm losing you on because I, I you're really good at saying it and I don't know what it means. So I get caught up on it. Uh, I, it um it, the yeah, the last part you said, can you repeat that? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I just want to make it in a way that, no that everyone can understand. If you it's don't good mind. though to break it layman's yeah. terms. Mm -hmm. So there's a, so there's some bacteria that you can apply on the flower, and then there's some fungi that you can apply on flower, or perhaps as a drench into the soil or on the foliage. And the reason why I'd be more I'd be I'd be less worried about those is that generally you don't have as many like inactive ingredients and things that like they don't tell you what's in there. You know, like they're not they're like secret formula. And that always kind of makes me, you know, a little bit, I'm a little bit cautious about that, you know. And I already know that uh, it's tough to get research already in, uh, in chemiculture. So, like, knowing that, I think the intellectually honest answer is you should be pretty cautious. But biologicals tend to be a little bit safer, I think, with regards to formula and things like this. So, you have Never BT, the bacteria, and there's different kinds of BT. And then you've got the fungus, Bouveria, and there's other ones out there. Gosh, thank you. Thank you. That makes so much sense. And I'm glad you said that because I continuously would have said I would not apply anything in flower, on the flower, or in flower in general. And you you just 
proved otherwise. So thank you for explaining so, that. That was really good. I've got a, I'll I'm say this, though. Yourself. I generally try not to apply flour as much as I can. Of course. I also think of course. There's, there's quality you did, control You did mention too. error on the side of caution. So that's important yeah. to note. Well, yeah. and I think anytime you do spray, even if it's totally safe, I do think it, it uh, disrupts the trichomes and all the other things. So if your goal is to have a good flour or like a hash product or something like that, then I think that's more relevant. If you're growing for textiles or if you're growing for seed or something like that, I think it's perhaps less relevant. BT so, is something that's commonly used uh, battle fungus gnats, right? The, the larva. I know mosquito bits, a lot of people swear by that. Um, and they're not applying it to the flower like you mentioned. They're they're using kind of in the soil, whether it be mixing up into water and use as a soil drench or, or whatnot. Um, so it's not like BT is really good against multiple types of pests, huh? So that's, that's yeah, what I was going to say, too, is the soil drench of it would be different in that case. Because if you're not putting it on the flower, then you probably wouldn't run into the issues, especially if you have a live soil, if you're dealing with living soil of any kind. Yeah, but the, the insect has to usually, in the case of the BT, usually the insect has to consume the bacteria into their gut. Basically gives them sepsis. So like the bacteria gets in, it produces, um, basically it produces proteins like fry and some others, and they basically rip apart at like a cellular level their gut lining, which causes all kinds of problems. Uh, and then it kills them. So that happens for the for the fly larvae, like fungus nests. It happens for caterpillars and things like that, uh, like the budworm moth that we're talking about. And buberia kind of it works differently. Contact is most important, um, and the the spores or whatever will uh, sort of develop and they'll penetrate the the body and then they'll kill it from the inside out. It's pretty gruesome, but it's very effective. Uh, sometimes it's got to be that way in that, that type of environment. You know, I've got a buddy who swears by, uh, I always call it the Myclo, but it's Myclobutano, which is uh, uh, Eagle 20. And that's banned a lot of places. But he still swear. He came over with a little bottle of something. I was like, what is that? And he was like, E20. I'm like, what's that? He's like, oh, Eagle 20. And I looked into it and I was like, whoa, no, 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 no. I'm not, I'm not about that. What's your thoughts on that? It's banned in a lot of places. It being fungicide. A little systemic fungicide. Um, like, yeah, what are your thoughts? I'm not really a huge fan. <laughs> For good reason, yeah. I think that, yeah. that's a reason it's banned, but it's still somehow, there's people somehow, some way, home growers, which is the thing that, that bothers me the most, that somehow will say that uh, this works best for them. But it's, it's, it's a super tricky. toxic and dangerous, like... Oh, yeah, it's you a tricky say, situation. No, 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 no. I, I appreciate what you're saying. I didn't mean to interrupt, but I wanted to say that, uh, like, yeah, I feel like a lot of people know better, but not everyone does. And so, and I've had, as you can hear, there's been personal experiences on my part where, and not even in a professional setting, where I know that there's people who are home growers who are using products that they shouldn't be, either ignorantly or ambivalently sometimes. And you know, that, that really bothers me because it, it makes it, I mean, it makes it so much more important to know who you're growing from, but not everyone has that luxury. So I feel like while that's good advice, I don't know how practicable that advice always is. There's a lot of people still running on a lot of old information, you know, and it, you know, whether it's ignorance or whether it's choice, I, I don't know. I, I, I really don't know, but it, it does still perpetuate within the industry and with more particular amongst a lot of the old growers, you know, the science is coming out, but they're just reluctant to check into it. Maybe it's because they've grown great product and it's, they, they think this is, I, I don't know. I, I really don't know. And I, I understand the complacency becomes a process all on its own. And I think that's what, how you get into the conversation of IPM, because I, I really feel like it stands for integrated preventative measures rather than an integrative pest management. Because I, again, I, I feel like a lot of this can be applied in terms of the the process of managing you know what you're doing you know keeping yourself clean not opening the tent as often good circulation you know whether you're trying to avoid mold pests um i, I had a question tied to this um but do you have do you have like a top three cultural uh ipm methods for for organic growers yeah, I do. Um, so yeah, just to talk about this a little bit, just as a primer, because you use the you use the the keyword cultural controls or cultural management 
So integrated pest management traditionally is often broken down into different groups. And it sounds like you guys already know that. But for those who don't, you have things like chemical controls or biological controls um, or environmental or physical controls. Sometimes people put those together or cultural controls. Cultural controls are actually my favorite because I often say that in, in professional work, I think this is true. It's usually where you get your most bang for your buck. You, I think that oftentimes it's like a structural thing that you're doing or it's a procedural thing that you're doing. So your SOPs are very important. Like you alluded to earlier, consistency is super key. It's very important. Uh, you can be very talented and it's fine, but like that one day or if you slack off for a couple of weeks or something, um, you can have an uh, emergency crisis happen pretty easily because the, you know, the bugs are, are always there you know, for the most part, depending where you are. If you live in San Diego, like me, they're always there because it's so hot and subtropical. But uh, my favorite cultural controls are probably uh, some sort of physical structure. Um, so like if you can put up a, an insect netting or something like that, a physical barrier like that can be really helpful, like for the budworms that I have over here. Because if you're growing outdoor and you keep the moths from laying the eggs on the flower, then that kind of eliminates the problem for the vast majority of people. So you don't even have to spray something. And that's really great. Four people can do that. Another big cultural control, probably the number one, I'm going out of order, is crop scouting. Crop scouting mm -hmm. is the, the number one thing I think that people, uh, even if they're doing, they might not do it as efficiently as they could. And also a big part of crop scouting is like knowing what you're looking for and then already knowing what your options are. So if you don't know what those are, and you're going to have a little bit of trouble, then your treatment time is going to be reduced. You know, the so-called kill chain. So like you go, you see a problem, you see something that looks like a problem, you identify that it is actually a problem, but rather than some innocuous organism, something that's not actually an issue, but it looks like an insect, so you might freak out. So knowing the difference between those two can save you a ton of money and time. Then on top of that, if you already have like a preventive um, action in place, maybe you found that, like you have some spider mite or no, well, a better example would be you have some like thrips and you already release some predator mites and you can already see that there's predator mites active and they're killing some of them. Then you, they're still there. Yes. But then you can come back with more predator mites or you can do a spot application of some biocontrol if you want to do that, or maybe even a chemical control that's safe. Um, so that you don't kill the entire uh, population of predators and other things that you're using. So crop scouting is really important. And then the third one I would say is kind of what I said earlier. So I'm going to repeat myself a bit and say that uh, a big part of cultural controls is knowing, actually knowing what your, what your threats are and knowing them for things that aren't really a threat, either something that's low or something that's not a threat at all. The two things that I'm asked about the most uh, and people who follow me will know what I'm going to say. It's springtails and it's mold mites. And those are very, uh, in most cases, they're no problem for people, uh, but they look interest. They look like pests, and for people who haven't grown before, if they're beginners or they just haven't seen them in large numbers, you know, it's understandable that somebody might think and misconstrue that they're a problem. Especially if you have something like a fungal problem or like a water mold that's uh, wrecking your plant's root system, and then the decaying plant matter is fed on by these organisms then people misconstrue them as the actual cause when they're not. They're just exacerbating what's already a problem. So you have to put on your forensics hat and uh, do your identification that way. Great answer, man. Yeah, I, I, that was really good, broken down well, because if you understand what's going on, I, I particularly have thrips and mites. And if I, when I, you know, have a good understanding of how those kind of come together and what things to avoid, I, I, I don't have to work on things afterwards, you know, and that's good. I'm glad you mentioned that. Great answer. I want to get your insight into diatomaceous earth. Now, I follow you on Instagram, and a while back, you had some uh, thoughts on that, some things to say about that. But diatomaceous earth, for uh, those that don't know, is, is very commonly used, uh, particularly for fungus gnats. That's something I use is you sprinkle it on the top of the medium, kind of work it in, and uh, it is said to knock back those populations of fungus gnats. Um, now, I know on your Instagram a while back, you had some thoughts behind it. Um, do you want to just kind of mention your overall thoughts? 
application rates or like just anything about diatomaceous earth really <laughs> i appreciate i see that uh wry smile that you have on uh because you know what i'm going to say which is that i recently posted about um uh, a researcher the name of which I'm, I'm unfortunately not calling to memory uh dr lloyd i believe christopher lloyd if i remember i met the person i met the guy before actually um very talented person i've read a lot of his research and uh he came out with not only one but two reports that apparently s stated that uh diatomaceous earth is not super effective against fungus gnats um and i guess i could try to pull it up if we cared enough to share the screen but uh, suffice it to say that his argument was that the de basically doesn't um when it gets wet it loses its um it's uh it's a fact because what diatomaceous earth is, it's like glass. It's like glass shards from diatoms, from marine diatoms. And they have this silicate shell. And so people harvest that and then they break it down into these small glass shards. So the exoskeleton of an insect, uh, even if it's a soft bodied insect, like the larval form of a fungus snap, um, you know, it does have these like particles and those shards basically rupture. So it's like a night you know, falling into a pit of glass shards. Like even if they're defended, other joints and things, they're less defended. And so they'll break apart into them. And again, uh, kind of a ghoulish way to go, but uh, it is effective in, in mostly in dry cases. And I think that the agricultural environment that people have, whether indoor or outdoor, um, uh, doesn't make it super effective. In my experience, I've also not found it to be effective, but it sounds like you've uh, found it to be effective. So maybe there's more to it than what this person is saying. Yeah, it seems knock it back. I know, you know, even if it was zero effectiveness on the fungus gnats, uh, still you mentioned it, it's actually silica, right? It'll break down um, and actually the plant will be able to uptake it eventually. And I heard it's more, uh, it breaks down pretty quickly. So it's more faster acting versus um, some other forms of silica. At least that's what I've heard. But um, yeah, I mean, it, for me, it seems like it kind of knocked back the population, but we got people who are swearing up, down, left, right in the comment section that uh, diatomaceous earth is like the only thing they use to knock back populations. And it's like extremely effective. So like hearing it from you and seeing like studies that are, are coming out in regards to it and seeing that's, it, that's not really the case. It makes you wonder, right? Yeah, I definitely agree, and I think it's a good point to mention at this at this juncture that uh, I, although I try to inform my decisions as empirically as possible, I've definitely come across my own experiences and the experiences of other people that seem to either call into question some of those results, or um, or are just a little bit. Uh, there seem to be like uh, outliers sometimes, and that's great actually, um, as long as we're looking at the sort of the hierarchy of of an anecdote versus like evidence, uh, it's important to look at those situations and sort of analyze them like, oh, maybe there is a weird outlier or maybe the observer uh, is mischaracterizing something potentially. But I think that's really important, especially in case. So people message me all the time uh, with questions and pictures. And I think it's it's been super nutritious to my ability to inform other people about things. For example, I get a lot of videos recently about termites getting into people's plants in the outdoor setting, uh, which has been very fascinating. And I hope it's not the Formosian termite, because if it is, it's going to be really difficult to deal with it. Yeah, that's that's way different, termites and plants. Like, this is another reason why outdoor growing, it, like, kudos to you those to do it. But there's so many more unique things to deal with. The two that, that Pigeons listed off are pretty the common ones, other than dealing with fungal things. And you know, little random issues that pop up, but it's insane when you think about all of the defense that you need to deal with outside. And while there's natural defense that you can't deal with that's already in place there, when you're dealing with something like that, like that's a whole different beast. That's crazy. One thing I think that um, is not uh, appreciated very much by people is that like, I mean, when you think about other crops, people think it's for, naturally, people think, oh, well, you can, you know, certain crops are better in certain places than others. Can you grow them in other places? Yes. Can you grow them economically, whether either in a home growth setting or in a large field or something like that is an entirely different question. It's also augmented by like a bunch of other extraneous things that I won't get into. But a big part of it is like, do you have this massive pest problem? 
that's going to be problematic for that particular crop? The answer might be yes, and so therefore people don't grow it there, right? Um, and so I think with, I think sorry, I think with this plant, uh, I think that this will be nice definitely catch, true. I, I I suspect it will be the case that there are places where. Uh, not necessarily it's impossible to grow, but it might just not be as uh, great to grow for the for the individual, or or at least at scale. So um, and that's a question. I'm very thankful I don't I'm have to thankful. deal with the things that y you're listing in regards to those pests. Like, oh my god, no thanks. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. even the desert. Like, I don't have to deal with the desert that uh, Chris has over on his neck of the woods. So it's like I'm very fortunate that I don't. I've got a fairly reasonable environment to work with you know um if we're caught we, we focus a lot on pests is there like are there just a few diseases that you would say are the most prevalent amongst the average gardener uh for our gardeners um i would say that uh powdery mildew is a really big one uh, glad uh, you a said lot that. of people glad get that. yeah um, that's that a lot of questions lot, come from that Oh, I'm glad. And if anyone has questions about powdery mildew, I'd be happy to go over them. I did a big deep dive um, on the FCP channel uh, several months ago, and I've also done other videos on my YouTube channel about them. I also have them up here for the for the common reference guide for the Pestapalooza because uh, basically powdery mildews look the same to various people. There's actually many different species, and most species are specialized on one or a few plants that are usually closely related, but not always. And for those that affect these plants, uh, you know, the taxonomy for powdery mildew is super um, uh, not put together. Uh, so the long and the short of it is that it's really hard to know if a powdery mildew on some other plant is going to colonize your plant uh, for sure. But probably not. Probably if you're walking around and you see some like dandelions with a bunch of powdery mildew or some zucchini, I don't think that you're going to be getting powdery mildew on the same. A, a, a suitable host will not be found in our plants uh, from that powdery mildew. But it's hard to know again. So that's one of them. The other one is uh, the various bud rot necrotrophs. So uh, very famously, people think of botrytis. But there's many other ones, and botrytis isn't necessarily always going to be the most common that you deal with. And it might not always be easy for you to, to tell the difference, really. So functionally, they're all going to have pretty similar effects. They usually have an association with reproductive tissue, so the floral tissue. And in some cases, they might actually live asymptomatically in the plant until the plant um, starts to flower. And then something in the physiology changes, and like, especially in the case of botrytis, this is um, the, the case where a switch happens and then they start to mold over on the flower. So that is the case, but you've also got like fusarium is a bit, is a pathogen that can also be a, a bud rot pathogen, but it can also infect wounds and can also attack in the roots and things like that too. So I did, I did two or three, I think I just said two, but that's fine. Man, I had bud rot right. before, and that is not a good thing at all. Um, so, yeah, I had it, like, in the upper, bigger colas, and, uh, you know, cutting them off, get rid of them. Uh, do you recommend folks to get rid of the whole plant or just the infected part? I think you can get away with just getting rid of the infected part, to be honest. Okay. I understand okay. I understand the concern. There are certainly situations where I guess it could be valid that somebody might want to tear it all the way down. I think that has a lot to do with um, maybe if you have a lot more plants and you don't have space and you really want to make sure other plants, you know, you might sacrifice one plant for others. Um, you know, there, I could certainly see situations and circumstances where you might want to do that, but generally by and large, I don't think that's uh, a necessity because the problem, because those spores are all around all the time, maybe even on your clothes, maybe even in your lungs. And, um, that's a topic that's been very hot lately, but, uh, basically if the spore, the spore isn't toxic by itself but the spores, the sporling that develops from it and the mycotoxins that something might produce, if it does, which they don't all, which none of these bud rot pathogens don't always do. But these uh, bio burdens, so to speak, are really a problem when you have all this mycelium and other um, you know, metabolites and things that are produced by the fungus. 
So if it's micro-sized, if it's all, you know, fungus over, then that's a problem. But if you don't have that, then, you know, those, those, those uh, subsequent issues aren't really there, if that makes sense. Got it. That's good to know. P's muted. No, it's sign language. And I think you guys had it. You're <laughs> reading my lips. Um, I, I'm really glad you mentioned that because I've had guys in my chat that have mentioned having bud rot and I've told them I'm like oh, through paranoia, you know, I'll get rid of the whole damn thing. You know, I'm, I'd be so afraid. And, and I, you know, I, I didn't really say get rid of the whole thing, you know, it's, but it, it, you know, that, that it's good to have clarity around these subjects. Um, you know, it's just the other day, Rob, Chris and I, we were having a few drinks over at the pub and uh, Chris was talking about hop latent. Did I say that right, Chris? I'm sorry. Hop uh, latent you, thyroid. Uh, yeah. yeah. Chris, sorry, did you have a question in regards to that? Yeah, I mean, we yeah, we're coming up towards the end of the segment here, but it would be nice to touch upon this uh, pretty quickly here. I mean, hoplite viral is something that's just uh, a large percentage of plants, the plant that we all know and love, is infected, yeah. and it has the ability to infect seeds as well. So right when you plant it, once it sprouts in the medium, it's already got the the virus. Um, now, can you talk to us about hoplite viroid, kind of what we need to know? Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, I've been so loquacious. I thought that we would. I thought that uh, we would talk a little bit longer, uh, but I understand. So I'll try to be brief. Hoplane viroid is a huge problem. It's still a huge problem in hop. Um, there are hop people who grow commercially, and even people who don't, they have to grow plants that are tolerant or resistant of hoplane viroid, or they will just not produce. So it's just not practicable at all. Still in the Pacific Northwest, for example. Yeah, they're very good. Uh, so, so HLVD, hoplite viroid, um, it's really insidious. It can be asymptomatic, and then it can start to be symptomatic at a latent period. That's what the latency mean, and it means in its name. It's a viroid, so it's like a very uh, complex little RNA fragment. Problem is that the plant thinks that this little strand of pre-DNA is uh, its own strand of pre-DNA. So it will then try to replicate it. It will turn the RNA into DNA and then back again. And then what happens is that uh, basically hoplane viroid bogarts the cell machinery of the plant to produce a bunch of it and not a bunch of the things from genes that needs to make proteins and other stuff. That's why a lot of the symptoms are so weird. Brittle branches, chlorosis, things like this where it's yellowing because basically the cells are literally like industrially producing more of the particles also move between plants when you're cutting your with your with your scissors or other implements and also it can even mechanically transmit between plants so just by brushing up against them it seems like that's one way it can move and then like you mentioned earlier it can also move from uh from parent to offspring vertically transmitted to seed females in particular not males so to my understanding and uh what else do i want to say about that well i have a big video about Viroid biology with an emphasis on hoplite and viroid on my YouTube channel. So you can check that out too if you're interested to learn a lot more. But all of these things culminate into a really difficult thing to deal with. And um, unfortunately, because these plants don't get a whole lot of agricultural support and infrastructure for very obvious reasons, uh, people who are home growers are left to kind of like kind of deal with this blindly. And I think it's a huge problem. And it's one that I think will require, uh, well, I think it even meets the definition for a quarantine pest for people growing commercially. And that could be a really uh, huge issue because if you get caught with it, caught if you report it or if you don't report it, it can be a huge problem because you're basically a liability to everyone else growing. Wow. Yeah. Commercially, yeah, not home grow. Commercially. I just want to say that. <laughs> We could definitely get deeper and do a whole episode on that if we really wanted to, but we are coming up towards the end of the segment and wanted to give you the opportunity to tell the viewers where they could find you. Well, thanks very much for having me. You can find me for professional inquiries at zenthanol.com. You can also um, contact me through social media. My personal Instagram is at syncangel, S-Y-N-C-H-A-N-G-E-L. You can also find me at zenthanol on YouTube where I post most of my uh, information about pests, pathogens, plant health, and that kind of a thing. So if you have something you want to check out, you can check out over there, find some identification resources. I just posted a recipe mite video all about recipe mites, all various kinds of recipe mites. 
um, including the ones that we're worried about and how to how to prevent them, how to treat them, and other things about their biology so you know what's going to work and what's not going to work. Wow, Matt, you and content like yours Man. is what keeps pushing our stuff forward. So like, th don't apologize for anything. Everything you dropped today was absolutely a bueno. gem. I thank you for putting up with my uh, inability to keep up and, and, and break it down. That was just, that was awesome. So thank you so much for that. And thank you for spending, this is a special day for us. This is the launch of a, uh, a, a new product for us. And we really want to thank you for uh, spending that time with us. Thank you so much. It was a great, great question period. So yeah, learned a lot. We'll do an episode two. I think it's definitely in need at, because there's so much more I want to dive into in regards to uh, so many topics that we didn't even touch. So thank you, Matt. Yeah, and dive much appreciated. Yeah, much one too. Yeah, we if you're available to come really on again in the future, it. we'd love you. We'd love to have you on. We could we could go longer, you know what I mean? So that'd that'd be great. I would love we'll that. keep in touch. I would really love that earnestly. Let's do it. I excited. Awesome. Cool. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Thank you so much, man. Thank you to everybody. Uh, thank you guys for watching. We'll see you next week.